Welcome everyone. My name is Kim Brown and I'm with the Rural Institute for Inclusive Communities Transition and Employment Projects. Teresa Baldry and I will be your moderators for today. Live captioning is available for the session. To access the captions, open the captioning link I've posted in our chat box in a new browser window. And you can adjust the background color, the text color, and the font color by using the drop down menus at the top of the browser. The captions will scroll up from the bottom, so you may want to minimize the caption box and put it at the bottom of your webinar screen. And you can also opt to show or hide the caption header and chat boxes. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Montana Deaf Blind Project, which is funded in whole or in part by the U.S. Department of Education Office of Special Education Programs, or OSEP, and through a contract with Children's Special Health Services at the Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services. The statements shared in the presentation do not necessarily reflect the opinion of the sponsoring departments. All attendees are currently muted. This helps to cut down the, on the background noise so that all of the audience members can hear the presenter. If you would like to ask the presenter a question or make a comment, please type your question or comment into the chat box. And please note that only you, the moderators and the presenter will be able to see what you've typed into the chat box. If you're not able to see the chat box, look to the upper right hand side of your screen. There should be an orange box with a white arrow in it. If you click on that, it will open your GoToWebinar dashboard and the chat or question box will be available there. For those of you who requested Montana Office of Public Instruction renewal units when you registered, those will be emailed to you after the webinar and it can take up to a couple of weeks for us to get those sent out. Please note that you do have to have requested the OPI renewal unit credit when you registered in order to receive that. If you are interested in a certificate of attendance, there will be a link to that certificate that comes in the follow-up email that you should receive from GoToWebinar tomorrow. So be watching for that email tomorrow. Today's session is being recorded for the Montana Deaf Blind Project and Transition and Employment Projects resource libraries. By participating in the webinar, you grant permission for any chats and or questions that you submit through the webinar platform to be recorded. The video for today's webinar will be posted to the training archives pages for both of our projects, and I will post those URL or website addresses in the chat box in just a little bit. The handouts for today's session are available for download in the handouts area on your screen on your GoToWebinar dashboard, and they are also available for download on our websites. When today's session ends, a survey will pop up. It's very short. I think we have six questions. We do hope that you will take the time to answer those questions. We use that information to continue to develop ideas for training and also to improve the training that we're offering. If you do not have time to fill out the survey today, the link will be in that follow-up email that you receive tomorrow, so you could fill it out tomorrow. Um, you do not need to fill out the survey twice. And now I'd like to go ahead and turn the microphone over to Ellen Condon for a description of the webinar series and the Montana Deaf Blind Project. Thanks, Kim Brown. This is Ellen Condon, and I am very excited to introduce everybody or welcome everybody to the, uh, the webinar series that we're doing about work experience and pursuing employment for students with a significant impact of disability, including deaf blindness. This is the first of four webinars in the series, and we have the perfect person kicking this off for us, um, Kim Norris Scrano. Um, because if you know, a bit, if, if you pay attention to employment for people with the most significant disabilities, some of the things that we know lead to a higher likelihood that a student with a significant impact of disability will be employed after they exit high school. First of all, is parent expectations. If a, a parent expects their son or daughter to go to work, then that that adult child is five times more likely than a young adult whose family didn't have that expectation. So Kim is going to share how she's conceptualized employment for Alana 
how she started really early to think about a working life and a meaningful full life. And she has this distinct gift of figuring out what Alana's skills and strengths are, but also what her conditions are for success and being able to take that information and turn it into work tasks and also activities for a meaningful life. Um, I also wanted to share with you the next dates for the web, the next three webinars. We're going to have Montana Voc Rehab joining us on, on December 3rd, and they're going to be speaking about pre-employment transition services and how they support students in work experience and, and also preparing for a working life. January 14th, I'm going to talk to you about a customized employment approach to work experience for those students who we just readily can't figure out what they're going to do for work and therefore what they should even do for work experience. And then Kim Norris Scrano is going to join us again on February 11th to share additional stories and skills and strategies. Um, again, this is brought to you by the Montana DeafBlind Project, and we are federally funded to provide specialized information and technical assistance resources that focus on improving the early identification of students with a dual sensory impact and also their education and inclusion, as well as preparation for adult life. This project serves students from birth through age 21, and people don't have to be totally deaf and totally blind to benefit from these services. It's any combined impact of, a, of vision and hearing sensory loss. So to introduce Kim formally, she is a self-proclaimed everythingologist, but her role as mother is a driving force in, in most endeavors. Her oldest daughter and greatest teacher, Alana, who's 19, was born with a rare chromosome difference. Kim's love for Alana took her into the role of advocate for her, and sharing her life experiences with others is a way of both paying it back and paying it forward to other families of children with disabilities. Before leaving the traditional workforce to raise her other three children, Sal, who's, who's 10, Serena's seven, and Cecilia, who is six, Kim taught special ed in fourth and fifth grades. And Kim and Alana have built a hobby business together. Their weekdays are filled with baking dog treats, tending barnyard critters, sheep, ducks, chickens, dogs, and cats, and planning their next adventure. So we are very excited to have Kim with us today to share her amazing creativity and skill in developing work tasks and building a meaningful day for her, her daughter. So thank you, Kim. Good afternoon, everyone. I just really wanna thank you for taking the time to um, have a conversation with me today. I'm really hoping that this can be more of a dialogue instead of just uh, a lecture. So. As I'm going through slides, please feel free to type um, questions or comments into um, you know, the chat box. And I have a lot of slides to get through. And uh, if I can answer your question right on the spot, I will. Some questions may have to be held until the end, but please don't be shy about typing into that comment box because my uh, purpose of doing this webinar is to make it useful for you, for the audience. Um, I first had the idea of doing this because, well, we've been home a lot since March. I mean, a lot, a lot, a lot. And um, fortunately, we have activities that we already had in place for Alana. But I know that um, there's a lot of parents out there right now and educators that are struggling with home-based learning. Um, because, you know, individuals with a significant impact of disability, they may not be able to wear a mask. And so Alana falls into that category. She's unable to wear a mask. And so I thought, gosh, you know, for some of her younger friends, what could they be doing in this time that's, that's productive when they're not at school? And how can I empower parents 
to be their child's best teacher. Um, so to start things off, though, I'm really curious about who the audience is. So um, Kim Brown is going to launch a poll question, basically asking how you are connected to an individual uh, with a significant impact of disability. So if you can just take a moment to answer this question, it will help me better gear my webinar. I hope that I can appeal to everyone. The information that I'm going to give is general enough that, that I'm hoping it can um, positively impact you, whoever you are. Um, but you know, there are special considerations if you're a teacher or a parent. We have 82% who have voted so far, Kim. So maybe 10 more. Okay. Okay, that sounds great. And I want to give a huge shout out to the paraprofessionals because that's why I listed them as an educator. Paraprofessionals, they are the backbone of special education. And if you are a paraprofessional on this webinar, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because we couldn't have done what we did with Alana without our fantastic paraprofessionals. Okay, so looks like we've got a lot of educators on. That's great. A lot of others. That's also fantastic. Um, just out of curiosity's sake, if you're able to type in your other connection into the chat box, um, that would help me because hopefully you're going to be on this webinar uh, in February. So, Hi, Kim. This is Teresa. And yes, you do have responses. So I have a response of F family support at ECI early interventionist, Montana, state of Montana DDP, home visitor, family support specialist, Montana's Parent Training and Information Center, currently Montana Empowerment Center, vocational rehabilitation, regional manager, manager of DDP with Yellowstone County, educator, special educator, education, transition teacher in the high school with folk rehab and pre -ex. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so this is my daughter, Alana, and um, this is our backyard. It hasn't always been our backyard, um, but that's one thing I'm going to talk about is throughout Alana's life, I've been intentional about the choices that we've made. We haven't always lived on a farm. In fact, uh, there was a period of time where I lived in a small apartment in downtown Billings. Um, so I just want to let you know that what I'm sharing, it's applicable whether you live in a farm or in an apartment in the busiest of cities of Montana. Okay, next slide. So the goals for today's webinar, I really hope that you can recognize the importance of preferred tasks, um, passions, even when they seem inconsequential. Uh, I also hope that you can understand how the simplest of interests can open the floodgates of possibility into the vocational realm and beyond. And then uh, to value the development of a life goal. Some people might call it a, a vision, visionary statement, but it's to focus the dream and to wrap supports around the individual to support that dream. And then I also hope that uh, I empower all of you to see a bright future for youth in transition, especially those with a significant impact of disability. And I just thought it was so ironic because while I was preparing this PowerPoint, I was drinking some Celestial Seasonings Peach Passion, and there was this quote, all passion becomes strength when it has an outlet. And that's 100% true. Okay, next slide. Um, uh, can we go to another one, Kim? Okay, I thought this was going to be at the end, but I, I can fly by the seat of my pants. Um, can you go back one slide, Kim? Okay, so this is a strengths-based portfolio that I put together for my daughter, Alana back in 2008. And a strengths-based portfolio is just, um, it's a simple, uh, a simple version of it would be an all about me book. And um, 
I just was looking at this recently and I saw how many of the things that she was interested back in 2008 are really still applicable today at age 19. So she's anywhere between the ages of probably four and six in these pictures. Okay, next slide. And she's always enjoyed getting into things. So you can see her, she's digging into the refrigerator, she's putting groceries away. You know, sometimes I, especially when I was a single mom, I'd wake up and Alana would have out the cream cheese and, and the oatmeal and Cheerios and some olive oil and she'd be pouring it all together and mixing it up. And I just, oh, I just wanted to pull my hair out during that time. Um, but we did find a way to um, take those strengths that you might not initially call a strength and turn them into something productive. So uh, again, she's always loved to do laundry, always, always, always dumping, pouring. So she's dumping the laundry in, pouring in the soap, loves it. Opening and closing the doors on the washing machine and the dryer. She's always loved that. Okay, next slide. Um, she's a busy girl and she loves to sort colors still to this day. That's really an important thing for her. Next slide. She's still learning new things. Um, here she is as a little tot matching her colors with the um, clothespins and the foam squares, matching numbers, using her tech talker. Um, she will learn when given the opportunity. Next slide. She's always been quite independent. Um, the light switch, I had to laugh when I saw this because still to this day, the light switch is such an issue. We cannot leave the house until every single light is off. And um, she, she makes sure of it. Uh, feeding our dog dog treats. She still loves to do that. Turning on and off the water. Yes, that's still a big deal for her. Okay, next slide. And um, I wanted to make sure that I included this slide from her strengths-based portfolio. It's just for perspective because, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to envision a future for a child with a significant impact of disability. And so when you look at these pictures of Alana when she's a tiny baby, barely even three pounds in the NICU, um, you know, really in the, some of these pictures, she was really struggling for her life. Uh, you would never imagine that she'd be doing the things that she's doing now. So again, like Ellen was saying, just holding that expectation high for um, individuals. And I always like to say no expectations, but no limitations. I always try and meet Alana right where she's at and then encourage growth from there. Next slide, please. So uh, kind of getting back to more current times, um, about five years ago, I was quite frustrated. I felt like um, our team had uh, different ideas for where uh, Alana was going in her life. And so I decided to come up with a life goal. And that life goal has really been um, uh, our mantra ever since. It's, it's the litmus test for everything we do. Um, I have to go back to, is this engaging for her? Does this have joy, purpose? Is it rich in personal relationships? Because that's her life goal. Her life goal is to live an engaged life full of joy and purpose that is rich in personal relationships. And so when I'm presented with an opportunity or you know, a, a certain goal comes up in you know, um, maybe an individual plan for employment or something like that, I always refer back to that life goal. And if it fits under that life goal for her, then we go for it. If it doesn't fit under that life goal, we leave it behind. So since, since that time when I formed that life goal for Alana, we also started a Facebook page for her. We didn't quite know where it was gonna go, but we knew it was going somewhere, again, that high expectation. So we call our Facebook page Alana Agile of All Trades. And that's where we really kind of showcase her um, hobby business and volunteering ventures 
Um, also, I, I see it uh, as kind of like um, a strength space portfolio, just like the slides that we opened with. It's kind of um, a resume of sorts, all the things that she's done. Um, and so it's neat to, to look back and to see um, where we've been and, and think about where we're going. We're definitely a work in progress. Um, so the things that I share today, you know, they, they may work for a certain family, they may not. Um, but, uh, you know, take, take what works for you and leave the rest. Kind of think of this presentation as a, as a buffet. Take what works and leave the rest. Um, next slide. So one thing um, is strengths, preferences, and interests. These matter. These matter a lot. And so um, I originally thought, silly me, I thought that the strengths and the interests from the parent's perspective and from the student's perspective, even the school's perspective, I thought that that was just kind of a nice icebreaker for the IEP meeting. You know, you want to bring out some positive things first before you delve into the deficits. Um, but as Alana got older, I really realized that the strengths, that is, that's the key to everything else in the IEP. And so as Alana got older, closer to graduation, we took those strengths and we used that as a springboard to um, come up with some annual goals because um, we wanted to focus on what she could do. And in the process of doing what she could do, she learned some skills that um, maybe were a little more difficult for her. So Alana, um, she graduated from Heisham High School in May of 2009. She was a, a class of three. And that's not three special education students, that's three students, period, in the entire class. So a lot of what I'm gonna share today is, is rurally focused, but, but we got our roots, we got the beginnings of this when we were in Billings. Um, and then the picture down here, Alana, she's tending her mealworm farm um, and our mealworms are doing fantastic, just so you know. <laughs> um, next slide. So I talked about how we use those strengths as a springboard. Um, so I know that she likes to fill, dump, pour. I know she loves those things. So I thought, okay, well, what sorts of activities involve filling, dumping, and pouring that are productive. And so she loved the bird feeders around our house. So I thought, well, maybe she could maintain some bird feeders around the community, maybe some outside the nursing home. Um, so the residents had, you know, birds to look at. And um, also filling, dumping, and pouring, she could bake bread using a bread machine. Um, perhaps she could water plants around the school. Maybe she could maintain a gumbo machine make concession stand popcorn. You're pouring a lot of popcorn in when you're making a, a big volume of popcorn. Um, and then also making dog treats. Uh, again, a lot of that filling, dumping, pouring activities. Um, she also really likes to shred paper. And so I thought, well, what can we do with that? Um, and we've used bags of shreds in our chickens nesting boxes. It's kind of nesting material instead of straw. Uh, we've also recycled old newspapers, the shreds, um, by adding them to a, a compost bin. And we've also repurposed newspaper shreds into fire starts. We um, poured some melted crayons on top. So if you look at that picture down below, that's one of our prototypes for her fire starts. Um, another thing that was a strength for Alana, it's been a strength of hers for a long time, uh, pulling and pushing carts and dollies and wagons. This girl loves to push the grocery cart. She really misses that because we have not been going uh, out into the community nearly as much with, with COVID. But um, back when, when she was in school, um, we thought maybe she could serve snacks to the elementary school students using the, um, using the cart. It's good to note that because Hysham is such a small um, school, it's early kindergarten all the way to 12th grade, all under one roof. So um, it was neat because Alana, she could interact with um, students of 
of all ages and everyone in the school knew her, which was pretty neat. Um, another thing maybe to do with pulling and pushing carts and wagons would be to maybe make some Italian sodas, maybe offer those to middle high school students. Again, she's gonna have the cart um, as she's pushing those uh, Italian sodas around. Uh, make a mail run to the post office, which she did all the time. Uh, grocery shop for cooking and baking activities. Again, she's gonna have the cart to push around. Collect and shelve library books. That ended up being a, a success for her. And then help with the school recycling program. Take all those bottles and whatnot and load them up into a wagon and pull them. That was just her jam. Um, next slide, please. So uh, we know what she likes to do. And we talked about some of the things that she did at school. Um, to really get specific, here's an IEP goal. Uh, with the help and or supervision of her aide, Alana will engage in all steps of the dog treat dough making process in five out of five trials. So uh, all steps, you know, you're gonna gather the ingredients, you're gonna gather the tools, you're gonna dump everything together into the mixing bowl, you're gonna mix the ingredients and then you're gonna clean up. That's the step-by-step -step process. But we wanted to make sure that again, those strengths, interests, preferences, they're built into each step. So when she's gathering the ingredients, she's opening and closing the cabinet doors, she's opening and closing the refrigerator, she's turning on and off the water faucet. Um, when she's gathering all of her tools, opening and closing drawers, pushing the cart with the stand mixer on top. As she's adding all the ingredients, she's scooping and dumping and unscrewing and screwing lids for the peanut butter and for the vanilla, and she's cracking eggs, all, all strengths of hers. When she's mixing the ingredients, she's turning on and off the mixer. She absolutely loves um, buttons. And so this is an opportunity for her to push away on those buttons. And again, you know, she likes that light switch. So if we want, we can hook up the mixer to a power strip that has, um, you know, a light switch style on and off toggle. Um, and she also likes to just watch the dough mix. So that was incentive for her, no doubt. And then the cleaning up process, again, she's gonna open and close cabinets, open and close refrigerator, turn on and off water faucet, uh, throwing eggshells in the garbage, all those things she really loves. And so that IEP goal, maybe the step-by-step -step process isn't exactly what she's keen on, but when you make sure that you add in all these other parts, then she can be into it. Uh, next slide, please. So again, when the task itself is the reward, there's engagement, joy, and purpose. So she's living her life cool. And there she is, she's watching. Uh, she, I think those are horse treats she's watching mix up there. And then she really loves peeling stickers, zipping and unzipping um, plastic baggies and filling those plastic baggies and the egg cracker, the easy cracker. Since fourth grade, that's been her favorite kitchen gadget. Anytime I get out the eggs, she's beating me to pull out the drawer for the easy cracker. And that's, that's something we got online for just $5. So we have about five of them. <laughs> um, next slide. Uh, so as Alana neared graduation, we continued to create opportunities for Alana to engage in her preferred tasks at school, in volunteer settings at home. Um, so like I said before, with the challenges of COVID-19, we've been working uh, harder than ever to give her more outlets for her passions at home. Um, so I thought that I might show uh, the video of bowling with the birds. This is something that um, we've we've done at home. And I think Kim's going to cue that up. And what I did was I drilled holes in the uh, bowling pins and bowling ball. And then she filled them using a funnel with scratch grains. Thank <laughs> you. 
Did you want the next video, Kim? I think you might still be muted, Kim. There you go. Did you want another video? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. And we are the Kong crew. And we wanted to take a minute today to let everyone know how we make Kongs because it's our favorite thing to do at the shelter. Um, and we're gonna share all the tricks of the trade. First and foremost, we have the Kong trays, and these are different sized holders. They're made with repurposed water bottle organizers, bowling set carrying cases, cut Gatorade bottles, and trays from paper. This is a repurposed uh, bowling pin set holder, like a plastic bowling set, and um, then just a tray, paper tray from Target. And this um, once held water bottles. It's a water bottle organizer. There were two parts, top and bottom. Oh, so I'm Kim, and this is Alana. And we are the Kong crew. And we wanted to take a minute today to let everyone know how we make Kongs because it's our favorite thing to do at the shelter. <sighs> and we're going to share all the tricks of the trade. First and foremost, we have the Kong trays, and these are different sized holders. They're made with repurposed water bottle organizers, bowling set carrying cases, cut gateway bottles, and trays from paper. This is a repurposed um, bowling pin set holder, like a plastic bowling set. And um, then just a tray, paper tray from a Target. And this um, once held water bottles. It's a Water bottle organizer. There were two parts, top and bottom. We also use clear funnels with different sized openings made from repurposed Gatorade bottles, two liter soda bottles, and a flip top lid for mustard. The slow flow kibble dumpers are another necessity made from repurposed honey containers. Smaller opening allows a smaller flow. Starts to collect in the funnel. So I lift the funnel up, close the bottom with my oh. fingers, and bring it over to the next pad. And the way you start rolling. So we have a honey jar that has super little chunks. Oh. 
tiny tongs and it's uh, got a smaller opening so the pore is even smaller. And then this with the mustard cap um, with the tip cut off. This oh, is our oh, extra oh, small oh. funnel and it takes care of the teeny, oh. teeny, tiny, tiny cards. Oh. And after a few couple shakes, um, your mini tongue will be full. And finally, the peanut butter squeezers. They're made for my purpose two liter soda bottle tops, gallons of black freezer bags, hairbands, and zip ties. So I have the comb and then I just smooth the top with a knife. Oh, oh. Flip it over. Oh. And use that up. Okay, here we go. We are filling up some baggies with awareness fire shards. Is she is? She's ready. Okay. Ugh. Yep, she's ready. We have a label on the bag. We've got ten counted out. And she's ready to put them in. Go for it, girl. Go for it. Please? Of course, yes. I'm sealing that zip. Shaking that bag out. We have a new feeding system for the lambs because they are 15 pounds of power now. Okay. Oh, and the next one. Here we go. Next one. Do the next one. Oh, you can just leave that one in. Oh goodness. She's shuffling things up for these little lambs. That's just an ice cream bucket. With the Hashim Alana is wrapping hair ties. If you can't guess why. Okay, you've got the yellow one done. Here goes the black one. Oh, try it again here. Go, Alana, go. Keep rocking it, girl. Boom. All right. I'll get some ice cream, Mommy. Uh, in a minute. Now we got the green one. All right, Alana, 38 seconds. How quick can you do these? Boom. All right, last one, the pink one. That's right, pink. Get that wrapped. You want ice cream, Cece? I hear you. Come on, Alana, you got 56, 57 seconds. Go, go. Under a minute? No. But she's going strong. 
one minute and 10 seconds. Good <gasps> job, Alana Rocket. Woo! We always choose activities that both Alana and I both enjoy because um, it, it just works better that way. Uh, the bowling with the birds. Um, she loves to bowl, loves, loves, loves to bowl. So I just took a, um, I took a bowling ball and I drilled holes in it and then uh, filled the bowling ball. Actually, Alana filled the bowling ball using a funnel uh, with scratch grains for the birds. And then I also had drilled holes into the bowling pins. And again, she filled those bowling pins using a funnel and a scoop. And um, we set up those pins and she used the, the slide as a bowling ramp. And that's, a, that's definitely a favorite activity of hers. Um, when she was wrapping the hair ties around the top of the, of the bottles, that was um, for our lambs. So our COVID project was for um, bottle babies um, that we picked up in, in um, the middle of Montana, just kind of on a whim, uh, but it's been fantastic. We love the lambs, but we wanted to make sure that each lamb was getting a full bottle uh, because they like to sneak off of each other. So we color coded the lambs. So we got some livestock markers, which is basically like gigantic um, oil pastels. And we put um, dots on each of the lambs. So one lamb had a hot pink uh, dot, another one had a green dot, um, another one had a black dot. And so we just make sure that the bottle for you know the lamb that had the green dot that she was drinking from the green bottle, which made it um, a lot easier for Alana's siblings to also help feed the lambs. And then that um, bottle system where Alana was just taking the bottles and dropping them into uh, those megaphones, that was the next step after um, we couldn't quite deal with the lambs knocking us over anymore when we tried to uh, bottle feed them right right next to each other. Um, we needed to just get out of the way. So um, that's when we created that that bottle feeding system in Atlanta. She loved it. She would load up those um, those holders and then she would come back through once the lambs were done drinking them and she'd pull them out and she'd put them in her little bucket and then we'd carry them back inside and then we'd mix up more formula for the lambs using her big ninja mixer again. She got to push more buttons. And um, so that that was a lot of fun for her. They're not bottle fed anymore, but I bet she wishes they were. Um, so uh, if you can do the next slide, Kim, that'd be great. Um, so again, just thinking about activities that Alana enjoys um, and finding a way for us to do that now at home. Um, so she absolutely loves the Children's Museum in Billings. They have this, um, they call it a wind tunnel and all kinds of scarves, silk scarves that you can put in above the, the fan and they fly up out of there and she just laughs and laughs and laughs. Um, and so she can't go to the Children's Museum right now. So we brought the Children's Museum to her. So um, we've got this, this white lab in our wind tunnel in our living room. And um, instead of just constantly sending up silk scarves, we thought, well, what else can we do here? And um, her 10 year old brother, he absolutely loves Nerf blasters. And so what we did was we took paper plates and uh, we made them into clay birds essentially. And so her brother would stand ready and she'd launch the plas or the, um, the paper plate up the wind tunnel and he'd shoot it with his Nerf blaster and just great fun, great fun. Um, and then we foster a lot of kittens for the animal shelter. And so uh, we found a way for Alana to play with the kittens uh, by using that wind tunnel. Um, we'll create cat toys that fly and so she'll send them up and then the little kittens will chase them all around the living room. Alana, she doesn't really enjoy playing with the kittens any other way, like with a wand toy or anything. Um, but 
she loves the wind tunnel. And so um, we just made it work so that it could also socialize the kittens. Um, and it's not just Alana, excuse me, it's not just Alana's brother that likes the Nerf guns, Alana likes them too. And so um, I don't really want Alana um, shooting <laughs> um, Nerf darts everywhere um, because she doesn't have the greatest of aim. Uh, so what we did was we took some feathers and bell and some ribbons and whatnot and we tacked them onto the end of a Nerf dart and then loaded it into the Nerf blaster. And so Lana, she can um, shoot the Nerf blaster. Again, it's, it's a toy for the kittens. It reduces the speed of the dart and she's playing with them and having a great time shooting that, that blaster for sure. Um, and I just wanna say that everything that we do with her, it um, is not purely vocational. Um, it just gives her an overall quality of life. So these are more like recreation activities, um, but really whether they're vocational, recreational, um, to me, it doesn't really matter as long as she's living that, that life goal. Um, next slide, please. Um, so something else that we've done at home um, for that joy and that purpose, Alana absolutely loves um, raising and lowering the American flag. That was her number one thing at school, all throughout her school years. And so not having that flagpole anymore, um, it, you know, it was a bummer for her. So we figured out another way for her to use a, a pulley because that's what she really loved is that pulley and pulling that flag up and lowering it down. So what we did was we, um, we attached um, our kittens or our cats food bowls to a pulley system. And you can see our, our barn cat here, Pocket, he's waiting very patiently for his breakfast. So Alana drops down the bowls, she fills them up, and then she pulls the bowls back up. And then you can look, if you follow that pink arrow all the way up, you can see where those bowls are now up on the rafters. So the chickens and the sheep and the ducks, they all stay out of the cat's food, but um, our cat can hop up there because we've given him a little ladder system. Um, next slide, please. So although Alana is unique, um, applying this method of identifying and developing passions for another youth in transition uh, is very similar, is a very similar process. So um, just to give another example, this is Waldo, a, a made up person. And um, he's a 16 year old male in his sophomore year of high school. Waldo has a nonverbal communication style. Waldo's free choice activity is almost always sensory bins containing dry materials like beans, rice, popcorn seeds, sand, oatmeal. Um, Waldo enjoys gently rocking, swinging, and bouncing on yoga balls. At home, Waldo sleeps with a weighted blanket in a hammock, and he is seldom without his dog, Rascal. So when we understand Waldo's preference for activities with high sensory input, um, what interests could his IEP team develop into vocational goals? So I'll give you a second to kind of contemplate that. Which interest could we maybe expand upon? And next slide, Kim. So I took, you could take any of them, but I took that Waldo enjoys the sensory bins. Okay, you could have taken the fact that Waldo was seldom seen without his dog, Rascal. We could have used that interest with his dog to brainstorm, but I chose to do the sensory bins. So um, out of that, maybe we could explore like making a custom wild bird seed blend, maybe for a specific bird. And we had talked about how uh, I had thought of Alana maybe filling up bird feeders outside of the nursing home. Well, you know, maybe Waldo and Alana could partner up together. He could mix the blends in, in the sensory bin and Alana could go and, and dump them in the feeders at the nursing home because Alana does not does not really care for sensory bins. Um, another thing that Waldo could do, enjoying those sensory bins, maybe create confetti blends for special occasions, maybe like weddings, graduations, sports events, whatever, 
using the wedding colors or the, the school team colors. He could perhaps combine dried tea leaves to make unique tea drink offerings, uh, maybe cultivate a mealworm farm using wheat bran, cornmeal, oatmeal as subtrate. And subtrate, that's just um, what they eat, what they lay their eggs in, all that. Um, he could also maybe mix some potpourri components together. And he could also take wild flower seeds and maybe mix them together, another blend. Maybe he could specify those blends for, you know, like uh, shade or, or whatnot. Um, next slide, please. So again, this is just my pretend guy, Waldo, um, but I, I gave an example where making custom bird seed blend for the backyard chickens, he was using a blender with an adaptive switch to grind dried corn kernels. If you've ever done that before, you know that it's very loud and the blender does vibrate. Um, so in this process, Waldo placed his cheek next to the blender and he seemed to quite enjoy the vibrations. And so I've got a little picture here of Waldo. He's, he's got that blender with, that, with the corn that he's crushing up and the switch, I don't know um, if you're familiar with an adaptive switch or not, but Waldo, all he would need to do was just tap the top of that um, red dot and um, it would work as an on off switch. So that would be great for students that maybe don't have um, the dexterity to push the button on the blender. Um, and a side note, you can search Montec um, and they have offerings of adaptive equipment like this. So you don't have to necessarily buy everything right away. I mean, there's other resources um, to, to look at first to make sure that it's it's going to work for the student. And if it really works for them, then you can, you know, think about buying it. But Anyway, so Waldo's team, uh, they began thinking of other activities that Waldo may like um, that encompass that sense of vibration. And I do want to say that um, sometimes um, we, we analyze things too much. So when you're brainstorming ideas for a student, you know, really try and avoid questions like, well, is this practical? But but how would we blah, blah, blah? What about transportation? What about cost? What about liability? There's always going to be barriers, but I find that if you focus on the barriers, then you just stifle that creative flow. Um, I say just get all the ideas out and then you'll look at the details surrounding each thing later on. Um, next slide, please. So this is Waldo's team. And um, they all had great ideas um, relating to the idea of vibration. So um, Waldo could polish rocks with a vibrating tumbler. He could grind coffee beans with an electric grinder, or he could mix paint colors with an electric paint shaker. Um, he could prepare purees using an electric blender. He could sharpen pencils with an electric sharpener, or maybe even refinish rink ice with a Zamboni. Again, you're just putting it all out there. Maybe some of it is funny. Some of it is, is so out there. It, it probably would never happen, especially if Waldo like lived in Arizona or something. Um, I don't know if they're gonna have um, an ice rink in Arizona, but anyway, you just put it all out there and then you look at, okay, what should we try first? Um, next slide, please. So I would say that when you're identifying these talents, strengths, and interests, look at much older IEPs or individual family service plans or evaluations from private therapies, because um, as I've mentioned before, you know, some of the preferred activities that Alana has now, turning on and off light switches, gosh, we identified that way back when she was probably three years old, back in early intervention. Um, so I know like Alana, when she was going through school, um, not everything was on the computer. And so she had paper files and she was one of those kids that had like, like three big, huge folders of her IEP papers. And I mean, like, and each one was like six inches thick. 
Um, and usually you think, gosh, why do we need her? Why do we need her original uh, child study team report from back in 2004? Well, you might be surprised because Alana, she always liked Jack in the Boxes. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember she did like that Jack in the Box. And um, when she was little, she was really motivated. I used to crank it all the way until the last little bit. And then she'd push the crank so that she could get it to pop up herself. But as she got better with it, she was able to manipulate the hand crank and she could go all the way and take the, the box from start to finish and make the little guy pop up. So I thought, okay, that's using a hand crank. Well, what other activities could she do that involve that hand crank? And so uh, we started rolling out our dog treat dough with a pasta maker. And we make really small um, training treats for some different nonprofits. Um, but she loves, loves, loves that crank. And that's her job. I cut out all the teeny tiny treats um, and she cranks out the dough. And usually I cannot keep up with her. Um, another thing that's not exactly a hand crank, but similar, um, we have a vise in our um, garage and Alana has used that to squeeze water from pulp rounds in the process of making one of our fire start, um, one of our experimental fire starts. And then another one that we do quite often is um, tumbling yard waste and food scraps to make compost. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these um, rolling compost bins. Um, they're huge, but the crank on them, it's, it's very simple. It's, it's very easy for her to crank that. And um, she absolutely enjoys that. And she is on the scene. She knows when something goes into the chicken box for the chicken so she can dump that out for them. And she knows what goes into the compost bin. And um, so we fill up that and then she knows when it's full, we go out and we dump it. Um, so next slide, please. So um, it's, it's good to note that not every idea is a hit with Alana. Um, we thought about, well, what if we use like a hand cranked grain mill instead of cracking the corn um, in, in a blender, what if we just did it by hand? And it, it was really too hard for Alana. Um, so her sister, Serena, she loves to jump in there and, and give that, um, that grain mill a uh, crank or two. But um, if we're not sure if an idea is gonna work, we really try our best to start small. And so we will search like secondhand stores, yard sales, we'll network with friends and family, say, hey, do you have an extra toaster oven or whatever? Um, and we'll maybe post on local, um, you know, in search of pages on Facebook or whatever, Craigslist. It's a good way to keep the costs down while we're exploring different things. Um, and then I thought, okay, well, what else uses a hand crank? You know, what if you're having this mental block, you're trying to brainstorm and you're having a mental block. I use Google and Google takes me down all of these rabbit holes. And I, I go, I go down those rabbit holes because there's amazing things to be found in there. Um, so anyway, I just typed in what uses a hand crank. You have all of this um, homesteading lifestyle. Um, it's, it's really quite popular right now. Um, that homesteading lifestyle at living off the grid. So I found, you know, generators that used a hand crank, butter churns, egg beaters, coffee mills, meat grinders, um, old fashioned, um, you know, uh, laundry that you use the, the crank to um, wring out the clothes, emergency flashlights, some of them have those hand cranks where you can just build up the energy that way apple peeler slicer core all these things use a hand crank um, even an antique sewing machine <laughs> has a hand crank so if you have an individual and that is their thing they could do that day and night you know maybe they'll be sewing bandanas for dogs one day i don't know um next slide please um so why is that life goal important? I, I've touched on this a lot, um, but it, it really does. It brings all the systems together. All the team members are working for the same outcome because sometimes 
you know, you have um, the school, their individual education plan, and Voc Rehab has their individual plan for employment. And, you know, maybe um, they're involved with developmental disabilities and they have like a personal support plan. Um, well, all of these plans really need to be working for the individual. And all of those plans, the goal should feed into that ultimate goal. And for Alana, that's that engaged life of joy and purpose and having those relationships. Um, next slide, please. So um, I want to talk about the goals for today's webinar, um, that we recognize the importance of preferred tasks or passions, even when they seem inconsequential. And to also understand how the simplest of interests, they can open the floodgates of possibility into the vocational realm and beyond, really to value that development of a life goal, wrap the supports around that, and I hope that I have empowered you to really see a bright future for youth in transition, especially those with a significant impact of disability. Um, I have just been talking and talking and talking, and I really, really hope that we can take this next little bit and ask questions, give comments, um, anything like that, because um, I really, again, I want this webinar to work for you. Hi, Kim. This is Teresa. So I'm going to give you a couple comments and then I have a okay. question. So the first comment is love the mix of entrepreneurial activities, volunteer work, recreation and chores, how those are all blended together and that all of these opportunities are work experiences, opportunities to explore that that employment options. Um, and then a question for you was, what are the mealworms used for? Well, the mealworms, um, we give those to our chickens um, as, as like a special treat. So our chickens and our ducks, they absolutely love the mealworms. And it's, it's so interesting how one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. So we have these chickens. And so we think, oh gosh, you know, wouldn't it be fun if um, instead of paying $20 at, at Murdoch's or Shipton's Big R, whatever, for this bag of mealworms, what if we did it ourselves? Okay, so you, so you start that. And then you start to realize, well, gosh, mealworms, they, they eat, um, carrots and potatoes for um their for their water you don't put water into their bins you, you just slice up these vegetables and put them in so i thought well gosh what if we um what if we grew our own carrots and we had tried again going back to the not everything works we had tried because we have a greenhouse um we had tried to do plant starts and that was um, like peppers and tomatoes and start them from seed and that was just pure disaster those tiny little sprouts they are so delicate and alana is she's not delicate in her watering at all and so i took over the watering portion of it um, she could fill up the the water bucket for me to to water them but that's about where it ended with her and so i nurtured these lives for what seemed like months and then we finally got ready to, to transplant some of them um and <laughs> oh goodness alana snapped them in half she snapped that stem in half and i just about cried uh, we had worked so hard for that but anyway um so we we decided that <laughs> that's not for us and um she's involved she was involved in 4-h she's kind of aged out now she's more of a volunteer now but we found out through 4-h that maybe maybe a little hardier plants are better for her so like rhubarb that's something that she entered in the fair that's very difficult to um over water or you know damage rhubarb it's it's pretty it's pretty tough 
Um, and then I thought, okay, so I'm, get, I'm getting off here, but it all comes back around to, um, well, maybe let's try the plant thing again because carrots, carrots are grown under the soil. So maybe Alana can help me grow carrots and then we can slice up the carrots for the mealworms. And so that's a project that we're doing right now. And then it's like, okay, well, we have the carrots, the carrot seeds. We have to plant them in this uh, loomy soil is what they called it. So it's got, uh, it's, it's light, it's kind of airy soil. So I was looking at some potting soil for vegetables and it's quite expensive. And so I thought, well, gosh, what if we just used our compost for that soil? And so it, it really, it all comes full circle. It, we're basically making jobs for ourselves, but we're enjoying every moment of it. Um, and so, yeah, so then the chickens lay the eggs and then we take the eggs and we use those in the dog treats. So it's just, it's, and we shred the shreds for their nesting boxes out of newspaper. And then again, we take those eggs and we put them in the dog treats or the horse treats or whatever we're making. Um, and so, yeah, that's what the mealworms are for. Um, so that's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> I've got more for you. So okay. love uh, in caps, all the creative ideas, great job, all in caps. And then another comment. Thank you, Kim. Good to see you and Alana and her name, Sandy Taylor. So okay. next is a question for you. Um, how do you take into account environmental conditions that have to or can't be in place for Alana to be successful? Um, I would say environment is one of the top things that I look for, especially if we're going to be out in the community. Um, there are certain atmospheres that are Alana friendly, and there are certain atmospheres that are not Alana friendly. Alana has to have the freedom to be herself. And so that involves cheering, that involves high fives, that involves hugs. Um, Alana is, she's never quiet. She really isn't. Um, Alana being Alana, you know, sometimes, I don't encourage it, but it happens. You know, sometimes she'll reach into someone's pocket and pull out their iPhone and start swiping through and <laughs> making a call, you know, and I am very thoughtful in the type of environment that Alana is going to be in because the things that she enjoys are so simple. We can dump and pour anywhere. We could, we could do that you know, at a nursing home, at the library, at, you know, the animal shelter. We could do that anywhere. We could do that if we were, you know, maybe at a recycling center. It doesn't matter where we're at. We can find tasks that involve that. Um, so I really make sure that Alana is with her people. Um, there are, there are some people that when they see Alana, they're visibly uncomfortable. Maybe they just haven't had a lot of experiences with individuals with intellectual differences as significant as Alana's. And then there's other people that just take her right under their wing. And, um, <laughs> they're like, you know, if your mom ever wants to go out, I'll definitely babysit you, you know, um, or can I take you home? Um, and so we have to find places where Alana has her people. Um, and so that just comes with relationships. That's where that really comes from. So like we started going to the library when Alana was like four years old, um, when we first moved back to Billings. And so the children's librarians, they saw Alana grow up. And so when it came time to volunteer, um, it, well, it came time for us to think about some volunteering activities. Um, I thought, well, let's try the library because we have that long-term relationship with them. 
And so we went into the library and it's interesting because the, the staff, they were more focused on, on what Alana was going to do. That was, that was their big thing. What is she going to do? And they fretted over what she was going to do. And um, I just knew that whatever they picked out, I'd roll with it. And so they, they thought, well, she could wipe down some books, some board books in the, in the infant toddler area because they can you know, get jam on them or whatever. And so um, we started out wiping down books. Now I knew good and well that this was not an Alana activity. I mean, she would dump the books out of the baskets and she might hand them to me, uh, you know, a little bit, and then and then she was done. But she was definitely not going to be wiping down any books. That that's just not her deal. But I knew that because she was around her people, I knew we'd find opportunity. So as I'm wiping down books, I look over and I see, oh, there's a table of Legos. I bet those Legos are dirty, just like these books are dirty. But we can go back to the back faucet and we can turn on the faucet, we can fill up the sink, we can, we can pour in um, you know, some dish soap into there. Alana can crank the hand crank on the um, paper towels so we can lay out all the Legos on the paper towels. And um, so we did that, we, we cleaned Lego blocks. We, we didn't wipe down board books for very long. Um, and then I noticed, oh goodness, let's look at this. All of their DVDs in the children's section were um, only filed under the first letter. And so if it was like Alvin and the Chipmunks, it just went under A. Or if it was Annie, it was just under A. They weren't specifically organized, you know, down to the T like books are in the library. So all Alana would have to do is match the letter on the spine with the letter on the shelf to, um, to shelve these DVDs. And so once I saw that, I knew that that was a task for her because we had a big cart and she got to push her cart down these aisles and she got to match those um, those letters. And um, yeah, it, it was great for her. So yeah, environment is super important. And you know, if I'm going to be in a setting where I know it's not exactly the most Alana friendly environment, I always make sure that I have a couple tricks up my sleeve. Um, not too long ago, uh, there was an event with an organization called Dog Tag Buddies. And we've been connected with Dog Tag Buddies for probably about three years now. Um, and we make little tiny training treats for their program. And they, they at no cost to veterans, um, provide services for them to uh, have, a, have a dog, a service dog that's trained to support um, veterans with like invisible injuries like PTSD. Okay. And so it was a special event at Dog Tag Buddies and uh, Senator Danes was going to be there. Um, Representative Gianforte was going to be there. And uh, I knew that it was going to be a little more formal of a setting for her, but she was delivering dog treats to all of the veterans at this event. So um, I brought um, some different things for her. I brought a, a beanbag toss that we could do in the back. Um, and I brought along a ball so that if um, one of the, the veterans, if they wanted, uh, they could play with the ball with Alana out in the pin. Um, so yeah, I think environment is, is super important. And so like at, um, Farmers markets, Alana, she really does not do well sitting for long periods of time. So um, we made this little Plinko board. And so when the folks come up to the, um, to the table, they can drop a little poker chip down and it just goes just like in the prices, right? It just goes ding, 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 all the way down to the end. And at the bottom there, it lists a little prize. And so oftentimes, um, you know, it's a sticker or something like that. It's a way that we can engage um, some of the people that maybe don't quite know what to say to Alana, especially like the younger kids, they don't quite know what to say to Alana. So Alana can just hand them a, a poker chip and they can drop it down and Alana can hand them a sticker and, and she can have that interaction with them in, in a positive nonverbal way 
Um, and it, it gives her an outlet to do something besides just sit there and wait for someone to, to come up and buy some dog treats. And when she doesn't have any customers around, we are, we are playing ball. We are definitely playing with those Plinko chips. And um, so, uh, you know, originally I thought, oh, farmer, farmer's markets aren't for Alana. No, they are, they are for Alana. It's just, we need to add some things to it so that she's got some outlets to be herself while she's sitting there. Beautiful, Kim. Um, so I've got a couple more pieces here. I love your ideas and finding other app activities for a simple procedure, example, the pulley. In my classroom and for my daughter who has a disability, it is totally about finding what their currency is. What do they love? Back to what you've spoken about and creating tasks where they do not need to think they are learning, but having fun. We do, we did a visual resume for my daughter. Awesome, I love that. I have seen visual resumes before and um, I don't have one for Alana, but I have seen them and, and they're, they're fantastic. I don't know um, if this individual would be willing to, to share that, um, but I think that you know, sometimes people just need to see, just to see that it's been done before and the, oh, okay, I could do that. Um, but if you've never seen it before, it's, it's hard to just, um, you know, generate something like a, like a visual resume. And she said, absolutely. So we'll be in touch with her to make sure that you get to see that, Kim. Awesome, awesome, thank you. And actually, with you providing the email address, she might be able to reach out to you directly. Yes, because I that would be great. Currently. That would be great. So um, as Ellen said, I am going to present again in February. Um, I would love it if, if you had something that is on your mind that you'd like to, to have me talk about. Um, in February, shoot me an email and, and let me know. And I'll try and incorporate that into the presentation. Um, so in February, we're gonna talk about how we, we've taken all of these um, interests, turn them into something productive. So now we have productive activities, but how do we really take that and actually build a successful, and again, successful is in the eye of the beholder, um, but you know, whatever success is to this individual, how do you build like a hobby business out of these, these tasks that you have developed um, and, and made into you know, productive activities? Um, so I hope that most of you that are on this call are, are able to, um, to join in February. And um, yeah. Um, if you have any questions about that now that you want to kind of, you know, um, visit about as kind of like uh, a preview for February, um, please feel free to ask those questions too. Kim, this, this is, go oh. ahead, Kimbra. I was just going to say we're caught up with questions and comments. Great. Okay. Thank you, Teresa. This is Kim Brown. And um, Kim, uh, while we're waiting, while we're giving people another minute to type in questions or ideas, I'll go ahead and give my closing housekeeping remarks. And then Teresa can see if we've had more questions come in. Just a reminder that a short survey will pop up on your screen as soon as today's webinar ends. So please do complete that. The survey link will be sent to you again tomorrow. So if you do not have a chance to fill it out today, please fill it out tomorrow. You don't need to fill it out twice. As Ellen mentioned at the start of today's session, the next webinars in the series include um, promoting work experiences for students, pre-employment transition services, and that will be with Montana Vocational Rehabilitation staff on December 3rd from 1 until 2.30 Mountain Time, and we should have the flyer for that out within the next um, two weeks. And then customized employment with Ellen Condon on January 14th, 2021 from 1 to 2 30 mountain time and again we'll have kim back with us on february 11th 2021 
You do need to register separately for each of those webinars and the registration links typically go out three weeks or so before the actual session. Just a reminder also that the recording from today's webinar will be posted to the Transition and Employment Projects website and to the Montana Deaf Blind Project website. And I've put those website addresses into the chat box so that you can reference those. Um, I'd like to offer a huge thanks to Kim for an amazing presentation today. I know that I learned a ton. Um, and to Teresa for co-moderating, to Ellen for all of her opening remarks, to our captioning professional, and to all of our audience members. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Teresa, for any other questions that have come in. Thank you. The last question that came in is more for uh, those providing the webinar in regard to, could you send all the classes in an email so I can put them in my calendar and share with a student teacher I have we have a, a lovely PDF that has a QR code on it even. So we'll make sure that that item is sent to your email address, but those are also available on our websites. So and that's all we have. And Kim, this is Kim. Do you have any final remarks you would like to make? Uh, I guess the only thing I would say is that, um, you know, this doesn't happen overnight. I mean, we talk about transitions starting when a student is 16. And then it's it's recently been said that, you know, we should really start looking at a transitional IEP for students when they're 14. I say the earlier, the better, um, because it takes time it really takes time and you know we hear about this um students falling off a cliff when they graduate from high school i've heard this before and so that was one of my things was i don't want that to happen for alana and so that's why we started so early and we had a fantastic team um, at Heisham School, and they really supported the vocational um, part of her IEP starting her first year there when she was a sophomore. Um, I think the time to really start thinking about um, what to do after high school, well, for me, it was when I really saw Alana kind of um plateau in in development she's always able to learn new things but it's within a certain level okay and um another thing that kind of cued me into i'm ready to start thinking about things vocationally was start to kind of see the same worksheets coming home year after year and it's like she doesn't need to be doing these worksheets anymore and if that happens when a student is in sixth grade then i believe then that's when you should start thinking about vocational things um so yeah i it was it was tremendous alana had really plateaued in therapy um in like occupational therapy speech therapy she'd really kind of kind of plateaued in the clinic setting. And um, so I visited with their therapist and I said, well, you know, Alana absolutely loves laundry. And uh, a good friend of mine, she just by chance owned a laundry mat. And so um, it was awesome. The, the um, therapy clinic, they saw the value in it. And so um, their therapist came, their last appointment of the day, and Alana had her OT and her speech co-treated at the laundromat. And so the occupational therapist worked with her with things like, you know, getting a little apron and she had pockets and then she could put the quarters in the machines and they worked on uh, the, the speech therapist, you know, she worked on greeting customers and um, 
it was so neat to see how that, again, that change in environment really uh, helped Alana to just, just bloom. And uh, it was very refreshing for the therapists too. So um, again, it's, it's just, it's never too early to start thinking about life outside of a, the classroom walls. Jim, this is Teresa. A thought has come in for the next webinar you'll be doing. I'll make sure you get this via email, but I'd love to know how Alana works with support services and agencies in the next webinar or how those resources might be utilized. So pieces for next time. Yes, Thanks. absolutely. Please do email that question to me and I'll, I'll definitely include that. Thank you, Kim. This is Kim again. Ellen, do you have any last remarks you would like to make before we end the session? I just want to thank Kim for her great information and stories. Um, I love the fact that you had Alana doing chores at age four to six. I think that's when we need to start transition planning and setting expectations. So I'm really excited about the, the next webinar. We will hear from you. Terrain. So thank you again, Kim. Thanks to everyone who made this happen. And um, I hope that, that you got information that's helpful and I hope to visit with you all again in February. And again, this is Kim Brown. Thank you to everyone. And we will go ahead and end the webinar now. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Take good care.